Amanda B. Johnson, and you are watching Dash Detailed. Today is a special group interview episode. In fact, it is five members of the Dash team answering questions that were submitted to us by you, Dash Detailed viewers. Because Dash's development team is global, you will find several different accents within this interview. And if you don't have much of an ear for them and are struggling to understand, just go ahead and turn on one of the many subtitles that are available for this video. Without further ado, enjoy. Okay, well, my goodness, welcome to Dash Detailed's first group interview with what many would call the uh, core team or members of the core team. I would call Dash contractors in general. Uh, each of our guests is going to start by introducing themselves, uh, telling us what it is that they do for Dash, in particular what they're doing right now when they began working for Dash, and what budget proposal from the Treasury it is that they are compensated from. So, uh, Ryan, will you go ahead and start us out? Sure, happy to. My name is Ryan Taylor, and uh, I lead kind of the finance function, or the Treasury, as I've heard it called many times. Um, and uh, right now I'm working on a variety of different things, um, everything from uh, formulating next month's budget to um, starting to build out our uh, strategic planning for next year and, and where our budgets could go then. Um, and I'm working on a bunch of tactical things like trying to secure the soda machine and get it repaired and, and potentially back on the road or uh, protected for for future posterity. Um, I started with Dash in a gradual process, so I don't quite know the date to, to let you know, but um, probably the summer of 2014 is when I first started interacting with the core team in a major way, and, and that's ramped up. I'm full-time since April. And then uh, the budget that I'm paid out of, and I think everyone on the call is paid out of, actually, is the uh, core team budget. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Daniel, will you introduce yourself next? Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel Diaz. Um, I uh, My role is primarily on business development, although as a startup open project, we all wear um, a lot of different hats. Uh, but in my role as business development, I seek out and nurture partnerships for Dash so that we can expand our ecosystem and start interacting more uh, with real-world businesses and other projects in the industry. Uh, as of right now, I'm working on a number of different uh, releases of relationships or projects that have already been established. Uh, one of uh, a couple of those we released uh, recently in July, which was uh, the Tigo CTM uh, ATM project and uh, Mycelium, our Mycelium partnership, which is a really good one. And I'm working on a couple more of those types of releases uh, for this month. Um, besides that, I also have some strategic um, longer term time projects I'm focusing on that are looking into uh, compliance and how we can uh, decentralize compliance so that uh, more people can participate. Uh, that's more of a research uh, project because as you would imagine, is quite involved. And as to when I started, um, just like Ryan, uh, well, I've always been a volunteer uh, for Dash, and I started maturing into my role, I would say early 2014, maybe March, April, just acting on my own as a volunteer, and then started working more and more with Evan um, that year until uh, the position I am in now. And as to where do I get paid from is the same um, core team budget, but in my case, I donate my share back. So I haven't really been actually paid uh, so far. All right, very good. Evan, will you go next? Uh, sure, so my name is Evan Duffield. I am the founder, lead developer of the Dash project. Um, and essentially what I do at this point is uh, manage core development and plot our roadmap and figure out how we're going to implement features so that we can uh, be, be on the correct path and, and 
uh, you know, launch this prod product that we're, we're trying to do. Um, I've been uh, working on this since 2014, uh, February or so, and then before that I was even uh, messing around with Bitcoin code way before that. So, uh, you know, it's been an ongoing thing, and um, I'm paid from the core team budget, but I uh, donate that, so I'm really kind of unpaid still. All right, very good. And Holger, if that is your real name, or maybe it's just your handle, I'm not sure, will you introduce yourself? Holger, are you with us? <laughs> All right. Holger Sorry. seems... Oh! <laughs> you did? I can hear you. Um, my name is Holger Schinzel, a flare in the chat rooms. Um, I'm a lease manager. I may. Yeah. Holger? Um, I'm getting just about half of your audio. Uh, I believe your audio would be improved if you were um, to turn off your video, if you were to toggle off your video. Would you mind doing that? Look. There we go. All right. Would you mind beginning again? And I'm the quality and release manager of Dash, and I make on... So um, that it all placed. Hmm. I'm afraid we are just not getting a strong enough connection from you, Holger. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll come back to you at um, at a future point to see if that has been remedied. Um, Robert, can we move on to you now? Yes, of course we can. So my name is Robert Wienko. Uh My role in Dash is a project manager, so I. Uh, in fact, work with all of the guys mm, present on the call and a few others as well. Uh, I joined the team, I guess, in January 2015, so a little bit later than the, the other guys. And uh, usually I work on strategic things with, uh, with Ryan, with uh, Daniel and, and Evan, like roadmaps, like strategy for Dash and, and uh, all of these high-level things that you can read about on, on the forum, on our articles. And, of course, uh, I work on coordination, communication, on, on reporting for our project or our sub-projects. Because at the moment, if I remember well, we, we are working on 18 projects. So you can consider Dash a, a program, not, not a single project, but, but a program. There, there is a lot of sub-projects in, in Dash. I coordinate the work of, of some contractors, not all of them, because it's impossible, as you can imagine, with 18 projects. And, and also, I'm usually a single point of contact for our external vendors and, and partners, so I, I can coordinate the, the communication and work and, and distribute the work to the, to the other people involved in our work. As the other guys, I'm paid from the core salary budget. Very good. All right. Well, thanks for those introductions, everybody. And as you know, uh, I solicited questions over the past few days from any interested users or even potential Dash users and got a lot of them in. Uh, I have categorized my questions. The categories that I have are 12.1 uh, details, 12.1 being the forthcoming Dash release. Uh, the next category is Dash in the future. So these are questions that have to do with uh, many potential uh, features, future features of Dash. Uh, they're more, more technical related questions, as Ryan mentioned before the call. Um, there is another category, which is a general request for various updates. And then at the end, we do have an Evan-only question. So, fellas, um, if you don't mind, I will just ask these questions one at a time, and then uh, whoever feels that he wants to answer them, please go ahead and begin. And then if anyone feels that he would like to add to that answer afterward, uh, please go ahead and begin. So, um, first, starting with 12.1, uh, the forthcoming Dash release. So, uh, Evan, you have said in your most recent updates um, that 
the a major change, if not the primary change in 12.1, is something you're calling Sentinel. And um, I'm not even going to try to describe it myself. Uh, I know that it's been dubbed as having a Turing completeness element of it. Uh, so will someone please describe to us in a, in a nutshell what Sentinel is and what this Turing completeness means? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So S Sentinel, it, it's easier to explain how 12.0 works and then the difference of how 12.1 will work with Sentinel. And, and that's, that, that's kind of a better way to frame it, I think. Um, with 12.0, uh, the budget system was introduced and essentially it was this custom, really small implementation specifically designed for that purpose. And so with 12.1, um, there's this generic system and you can you can make objects and you can program functionalities into these objects and store them using the system called Sentinel. And then basically what, what we're doing is we're using this generic system to recreate the functionality of 12.0 in 12.1. But um, it, this is the foundation for evolution so it actually will support all of the rest of the, the functionalities and, and later, later things that we're going to be adding, like users and groups and these shared accounts and pay to URL and all these like cool features that, that we're, we're working on. And so as, as an interim step of, of getting from one place to the next, we decided um, why not just clone the functionality of 12.0 into 12.1 using this generic system to kind of show the power of the evolution system. And then once we have that live, then we're going to start implementing the rest of these, these alpha, pre-alpha pre or alpha features of evolution. So you'll be able to like register user accounts soon after that and, and things like that. And this all can be done live on the 12.1 framework. Okay, so you're saying that the, the end user features of evolution, which as you mentioned, will be like PayPal feeling like things, like ability to pay by username, um, ability to register via web with username and password, these sorts of things. You're saying that in 12.1, Sentinel is going to enable those things to be used prior to evolution, say like vi uh, like via command line or something, like for for a more advanced user. Yeah, exactly. So it's a CLI, and it's it's basically you know nerds will love it. it you just type out the the commands in there and execute it. But then we're going to make GUIs on top of that, and we're going to utilize the same functionality. And so you'll be able to do everything you want to do in evolution via command line before you can do it in the GUI. Okay. And I imagine that will provide for a great deal of testing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that leads into the 12.1 and 12.2 testing where we're going to start hammering this with, with all the various things you can do with it. Right. Okay, so now 12.1, uh, if I remember correctly from the last update, will be released to public testing in about a week. Is that correct? This has been a multi-phased uh, test net situation that we've that we've been doing. Uh, so 12.1 was originally tested, and the, the core functionality of it has been um, tested thoroughly. And then now we're implementing the Sentinel functionality, and then in in a, a few days, sometime this week, I, I'm hoping, we're going to release the next version with, with some of these Sentinel features. The first ones are uh, proposals and super blocks. And so we'll have that out this week, and then we'll be testing uh, in, in the next iteration of, of public testing. OK, very good. Well, moving on. Um, oh, actually, I did have another question. Uh, the, the, the forthcoming testing round. How, how long do these testing rounds generally last before something is said to be ready to release as public? Uh, with this one, it, it should be maybe a month, a month mm -hmm. and a half tops. So we're, we're looking to launch definitely within two months from now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. All right, moving on and shifting gears a bit, still with 12.1, uh, I believe, um, the, the question is about Masternode uh, Trezor support. Is this being tested uh, totally in tandem with 12.1, and is it expected to be released in public version at around the same time as 
Um, I think I can contribute to that one. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, there's a team uh, working on um, hardware wallet integration for masternodes, right? Mm -hmm. So we want masternodes on hardware wallets. And right now, it's, it's already working on, on testnet. Um, so we have it working with uh, Trezor and KeepKey. And in the case of Ledger, um, you can't yet uh, host masternodes on Ledgers because of some changes we need to happen on the Ledger site that they say uh, won't happen until they have their SegWit update for Bitcoin. So uh, it may still be a few weeks um, before it's supported on, on Ledger 2. Uh, but uh, Trezor and KeepKey keep work on testnet. Now, uh, on mainnet, we really need a protocol update, um, some changes. Uh, Polgar could um, explain that part better. Um, but uh, as of right now, uh, we would be waiting for the 12.1 release. So meaning together with 12.1, um, hardware wallet support would, would already be included. Uh, now, it may be, or you know, it, it may be possible that some something can be changed on uh, the 12.0 version so that uh, this is supported before that. But right now, uh, it's really looking like it's going to be together with with 12.1. All right, I understand. And Holger, I would love to give you another try here. Uh, do you have anything to add to what Daniel said? What's the that? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I missed it, but I'm sure it was witty. Very good. And <laughs> moving up. <laughs> Very good. All right. And, uh, and a final question in this category is, um, I know that with the release of 12.1, uh, uh, current ongoing budget payouts um, will need to be resubmitted. And a question is, uh, do any of you have any thoughts on submitting in the future, like task-based or even like role-based, um, separated out budget proposals, or uh, do you prefer yeah, the maybe, idea? Yeah, maybe I can. Sure, please. Yeah, maybe I can uh, take a crack at this one and share my views on it, and, and others can chime in. Um, you know, I I see. I search the argument and the value for breaking our budgets up into tinier and tinier components that, that people can weigh in on on a very individual basis. There are certainly some people who want to be able to do that. Um, I do think that we need to be mindful of the fact that we have a certain mind share of investors. There are certainly some of some investors who who dash is their primary investment. They've uh, really committed to it. They spend uh, many, many hours every week on the forums, uh, engaging in discussions on these and so forth. But there is a large contingency of, of folks who this is one of but, uh, of but many of their investments. And if we're only able to garner a certain mind share from the majority of uh, master holders, I don't think we can expect to have you know, 200 different uh, budget proposals for people to vote on. At that point, people just stop voting. And we've already seen, I think, in the numbers of votes that we've been getting lately, kind of a, a fatigue, a certain level of fatigue. And so I think we need to weigh the consequences of more budget proposals against the benefits of more budget proposals. And I think the way that a lot of organizations deal with these complexities is, um, you know, potentially through uh, creation of, of a board that can spend time on behalf of those who elected them to really dive into these issues and provide guidance to a team. There are other people who have philosophies about, well, I'm really betting on the team as a whole. You know, you talk to investors like Warren Buffett or something, and, and his his approach is, well, let's empower the team to make a lot of these types of decisions. And so I think we need to find the right balance. I think that the technology itself allows us to do things that maybe aren't possible with other models like public companies. 
where they only get to vote in uh, directors once a year and they serve two, three year terms or something like that. I think that the technology itself allows us to be much more nimble in the way that we approach governance and budgeting and decision making around financial issues. But I think the wrong answer is certainly to go in the extreme direction right away in completely untested waters, which is let's vote on every single expenditure. And I just don't see how that could function realistically with investors that we have limited mind share from. Yeah. Um, can, I add, can I add something to this? Please, Kat. Robert, I mean. <laughs> yeah, sure. So this can be considered from two sides, I, I believe. One is uh, a perspective of the core salary budget, right? And the, the, the second perspective is uh, the other, let's say, projects. And um, from project manager perspective or general management perspective, the, the lower level of effective management is the project level, right? It is completely impossible to, to manage the granularity on the task-based or, or person-based budget proposal because overhead required to manage all of this will be much bigger than, than any you know, gain or any advantage that we, we could potentially uh, get from, from this, this new big granularity. So for me as a project manager, the, the right level of, of granularity is, is project, right? And, and the project and the team level is optimal from my perspective. Yeah, I have just one, one, one final thought on it. Um, I think the, the rationale behind the question is, um, you know, we can be more decentralized or, or you can add uh, more layers of control uh, for the public and for the users in general. And, but I think you have to make this a relative question. I would, I would dare say that Dash has the most transparency um, in terms of uh, cryptocurrency project management that I've seen in the industry because there's an element of forced transparency to the blockchain funding system. Uh, the funding system has teeth. It really does uh, put pressure on um, the contractors, on uh, the team behind the project uh, because investors have a say as to whether they want to fund the team, as to whether they want to fund a particular project. And I think uh, that's a lot more than what you see on, on the typical cryptocurrency foundation. You don't have any transparency as to how most of these foundations are spending their ICO funds. Um, you don't get uh, regular financial reports. You don't get regular update reports. So there's, there's just a forced transparency that raises the bar in terms of where we are already. Now, from there, you can start discussing like we're doing now. Should we be more granular? Uh, you know, where is the line? But I, I, I think we need to take a step back and think of the, the fact that the system allows for everyone in a fully transparent way to see how the funds are allocated and participate in that decision. So, so I think it's already a very good system. And, yeah, we can continue to discuss how to improve it uh, as we go. Thanks, fellas. All right, our um, our actually it's time for the next category, as I see here. Uh, so we are to the dash in the future category, and these questions uh, are about uh, features that have been talked about uh, future integration into dash, and so it's basically they're seeking details on those. Uh, so the first question is how. Will Dash prevent uh, centralization of ASIC farms, which is basically the situation that, for example, uh, Bitcoin has right now? And I know that there's been talked before um, about switching the blockchain generation from miners, from ASICs, to master nodes themselves. And so if that is still in the plan, um, how will that switch make it so that centralized ASICs, which will still be running, which will still be mining, how will it make it so that that is not a problem? I'll take that one. So the, the idea here with uh, 
collateralized mining as opposed to uh, the, the normal type of mining that happens in, in Bitcoin and other cryptographic currency networks is that um, you have to have some skin in the game in order to mine. And so we want to end up there, but you have to kind of describe the, the current state of where we're at. And, and this, this isn't such a, a huge deal right now. What the, the problem that, that we have is that we want ASICs, and we want the investment, and we want multiple versions of them, and we want them to be really, really powerful, efficient, and we, we want that hardware, so we can't dissuade those, those investments from happening. And so there, there's, this, um, there's this time that, that we have to, to set up, and we, we want to take action eventually before the centralization happens. And so what causes centralization? And usually that's imbalances of some kind. If you look at uh, the Chinese ASIC market, they have the, the lowest labor cost, and they have really, really cheap electricity, more so than any other place. And over time, over long periods of time, that really uh, that leads to them having um, super efficiency compared to their competitors. And so we stop it before it gets to the end result. Right now, we're we're in a pretty good place. We have a lot of investment. We have a lot of hash power coming to the network. And so the idea here is let's launch launch evolution first, and then let's come back to this. We'll we'll give the whole market some time we'll say you know at point X we're gonna switch to this other model where we have collateralized mining and what what that's gonna mean is even if we have ASIC farms at that time they'll they'll start to be able to contract their hash power to the collateralized miners reselling it away from themselves because they can't be the ones mining themselves at that point but they can surely you know sell the hash power and still make money off of it and so, you know, there's, there's, not a, there's not a huge need for this right now, but there's definitely a need for it before we get into the situation that Bitcoin's in. All right. Uh, next question is, um, so as uh, there's been uh, talk of uh, decentralized masternode shares, uh, which for the user experience of that would be something like interest-bearing accounts being... Uh, a, a planned feature down the road, p potentially even post-evolution, I'm not sure. And uh, someone was wanting to know about the voting uh, when, the, when multiple people can own shares in one decentralized masternode. And so someone described for me how that masternode would get to vote, if at all. Uh, the, this is mostly theoretical at this point, but the way I'm thinking okay. about it is that these masternodes, these, they're, they're, they're essentially group-owned masternodes, and the group should have voting rights among themselves. And let's say there's 100 people to one masternode, and they all even have different shares. Like, let's say one of them has half of the masternode, and then among the other 99, they have the other half. Well, they should be able to vote in kind to their investment within that masternode. And then you should allocate or um, tally up the, these, these votes of the 100 people and then decide, you know, did they want X or did they want Y? And then the masternode as a whole would have, like, a group message type of ability where it could say, you know, my participants voted for this. And then they, they would get grouped into singular, singular much more powerful votes that the, the network reads. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Amanda, I, I had one, one comment to the previous questions about um, the ASIC or the mining centralization. And I was thinking about it, and I just w thought I would add it. And it is that in the case of Dash, uh, there's also one difference, just the, flag, the, the fact that we're already splitting block rewards um, kind of gives the network a little bit more time uh, because all of the uh, economic incentive is not going towards um, the mining crowd, right? So there's also economic incentive for the nodes and for the, the treasury um, so that it doesn't compound as fast 
as in the case of Bitcoin, right? Uh, because when when you have some sort of economic advantage, which is what mine, what causes mining centralization, the fact that you are uh, pushing all of the resources through the economic advantage kind of compounds it and makes it faster. So in the case of Dash, there will still be space um, for other development work to happen, uh, from the treasury and for uh, the network to grow and be healthy um, despite of what's happening to the 45 percent uh, that's located in the mining sector so you can say we need to uh, worry about mining centralization but we need to worry about it affecting 45 percent of the inflation and we need to concentrate on how to solve for that but still uh, that leaves unaffected the other portion of funds that are going to other directions and should also slow uh, the process. That's, that's a thought I wanted to throw in. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, ah, there was mention in the last development update, uh, text-based development update, uh, something about a decentralized exchange uh, to be, I think it was put into evolution or something. I'm not sure. That was the first time I had heard of such a thing. Uh, can someone confirm or deny this extent, this exchange bit and kind of expound upon that? There's no decentralized exchange that directly will be hosted on the master node network, so I'd have to deny that. But we, we are um, involved in in a decentralized exchange project that Daniel could could uh, talk about if he desires. Do you desire, uh, Daniel? <laughs> sure, uh, why not? Um, as part of the uh, Fiat Gateways projects, which I think is something that we'll, we'll be discussing today, um, we part of the idea is we want to work towards a trustless exchange future. Um, so with our partner, um, Ira Miller and the Git Guild, um, the idea is to use uh, part of the, the building blocks that, that uh, we're developing for this project. So um, in this project, there's, there's, it's primarily a business development project, right, ahead of a software development project. Uh, but there are software uh, development tools that are necessary in order for us uh, to nurture the partnerships that we're working on and that we've been discussing and will be discussing later on this video call. Um, but on the exchange part, uh, what we want is to create kind of like uh, eventually with this building blocks to create a trustless exchange experience, um, you know, where, where the users are holding a key, uh, the exchange is holding a second key, so that is uh, full reserve and you can make uh, trades, uh, but you know that the exchange never really has control. Um, so it's a, a multi-sig uh, type exchange relationship with uh, one of the keys controlled uh, by the user. Um, so this is something we're working towards. Um, it's definitely not a, a short-term project. Um, I, don't, I don't expect to release something like this um, this year but it's definitely something we have as a goal um, for, let's say, over the next year or so. Okay. And so this is not something to be hosted within the Dash network itself, but rather something that Dash would be integrated into. Am I understanding that correctly, Daniel? Yes, you're understanding correctly. Um, I think that right now the master network is reserved uh, for metadata and evolution-related uh, information and systems. I don't think we will uh, in the short term be hosting uh, additional services on top of it uh, that I know of right now. Uh, but yes, we we are uh, working on this as part of let's say our business development strategy and, and relationship with partners. Um, there's a few partners that are interested in this project already. I am not at liberty to share um, their identity at the moment, uh, but this is not a Dash only effort, it's more of a group, a consortium of sorts, joint venture okay. type project. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is, does anyone foresee a point in Dash's future when the protocol development reaches a standstill, as in Bitcoin currently? And if so, what, if anything, could 
be done to prevent such a standstill? I would say that um, the, the possibility of that happening within uh, Dash is near zero because for, for one thing we publish ahead of time the, the ideas that we have and, and the, the roadmap and where we want to go with the currency over a period of years. And, and this is something that the networks that, that the networks understands and kind of approves of because they start approving the projects that are funding that plan as it goes on. And so the, the only way that protocol development could reach a complete standstill is if there were two of those plans and the network was divided amongst them. But uh, then again, we would have a vote and we would decide, does the network go with A or B? And then we would just move forward. So, you know, I, I don't see it as an issue and I, I don't think it would, I don't think it could happen. Very good. Uh, next question being, uh, what is the current transaction per second capability uh, in Dash? And what do you think that can and should be? And if you think it should be higher than what it is currently, what mechanism can be used to increase the transaction per second capability? Um, I just did the calculation in my head, and I think it's 28, 28 per second. And uh, that's because Bitcoin's seven and we're four times faster in block rate than Bitcoin. Um, but the the issue with with that is that there's there's this cap and we have we have a block size cap essentially. And so you know what what we want to do is to to use the, the actual blockchain as the settlement layer for our network and then we want to have a secondary layer of of high transactional uh, throughput that sits on top of the network on the evolution layer and then when when that needs to make updates it would it would do one of these these settlements onto the main ledger and so this could give us a uh, much higher capability and, and then you know even even at 20 20 something per per second that's enough because we could be settling thousands tens of thousands or even millions of transactions in these larger ones now, evolution is sounding like it has like lightning capabilities, like a lightning network-ish thing. Am I understanding correctly that that's what you're saying, Evan? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not lightning. We're going to use a credit-based system. And so, whereas lightning is this crazy contract system that's really cool, by the way, and we could actually run that on the Masternode network and just leverage their technology, but we, we want to make um, something that the credits. So kind of like the, the way that um, that your bank account works. If if I sent you money and then you sent Robert money, it would be like let's say I send you 10 dash and then you said Robert 10 dash. It's minus 10 to me plus 10 to you and then it's minus 10 to you plus 10 to Robert. And so that's kind of the way evolution would work from from the secondary layer perspective and then that would settle on the blockchain. All right. Thank you. Next question I think is... The distinction to note there, though, is that Lightning Network is a centralized, uh, you know, creation, and, and uh, this would be implemented in a decentralized way. Well, Lightning is not quite centralized. It's federated, right? Yeah. Which, it's, it's halfway in between the two. And, you know, it's actually not the dangerous type of centralization, I, I would argue, as well. But, you know, it's still, it, it still doesn't run very well, and it's not incentivized. But, like, if you took their federated model and then stuck it on our master node network, it would work really well. Because then, then um, it's, it's pretty much immune to attacks because it's collateralized at that point, And it has thousands of servers to run on. And so the, their node infrastructure would run really well on our network as well. Something to consider. All right. What, uh, rather, will future Dash wallets be based off Electrum or QT, or will they be completely rebuilt from the ground up for evolution? Um, so we're always going to have a core wallet based off of QT. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the foundation of, of the implementation of protocol. And then that's the reference client. And so 
anyone that builds another wallet will make sure that the functionality works the same as in the reference client. And so that, that's kind of how the development mirroring kind of works. Um, Electrum is an implementation that was based off of the, the um, client, and it's SPV. So we're not always going to have um, that type of client. We're going to this, this uh, third layer client where all of the functionalities are, are implemented through API. And, and those, those are going to be a, just a different classification of wallet that we just don't have yet. Uh, the first example that I'll have of it is in uh, my Atlanta, Georgia presentation at the meetup, where we're going to have uh, a working demonstration of the software. How, however, it's a standalone, and it's really early, but it, it'll show off our, our future type of wallet. And when you say this is a type of wallet we don't have yet, do you mean that Dash doesn't have yet, or a type of wallet that's never been invented before, that Dash will be first to have? Uh, yeah, never invented before. And and the wallet uh, that you're describing is one that feeds off the the decentralized API, the the DAPI. Is that is that correct? Yeah, precisely. So the the way it works is that we have a, a wallet right now, and it's essentially looking to a localized database, um, and it's it's going through the, these these APIs that are going to map to DAPI. But right now they're hitting this database, and we're going to replace that with DAPI, and then so then it's going to just start hitting these these endpoint APIs on the target master nodes that it's supposed to be talking to. And then after that, we're in business. Then it should be able to do everything we want it to do. I understand. All right. And this takes us into our second to last category uh, entitled Other. And the first question in this category is, uh, do you feel, any of you feel, that uh, Dash's current anonymity solution being a take on coin join could be improved? Do you see a place for new technologies, such as ZK Snarks, in a new approach to Dash's anonymity solution for evolution? And to clarify there, I do believe that the ZK Snarks is the anonymity function of something like Zcash. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. You're right. OK. Um, I, I guess I'll get this one. Uh, so the, the current CoinJoin system is more for fungibility. And I think I've said this a million times. The, the idea is that we want a currency that will last 100 years without coins being tainted. And the, the real issue here is that if I have a coin and you have a coin, they should be worth the same amount, no matter if it's right now or if it's in 20 years. No matter how many people have used it, neither of our coins should have enough history for them to be worth less than the other. And so that, that's the idea of having a, an anonymity solution built into the protocol itself. However, it doesn't need to be super fast. It doesn't need, it, it needs to be exactly what it is right now, you know? And um, that's not a great consumer-facing product, though. So we need to uh, build something else that the third tier uses that will, you know, anonymize money in just a few seconds. And, and we'll do that, but... Um, I don't think ZK Snarks is what we want to do. Um, it, it's really cool technology. It would, um, it would be better applied, for example, for masternode voting, where you, you could vote on things, and literally no one would have any clue who was voting on what. And that, that's kind of a neat approach for uh, a voting system. But um, yeah, I would say that I don't want it in place for the third tier. Yeah, I, I would like to add something on on this question. Um, I think uh, the key message here is um, that in Dash, uh, we don't want to go for obscurity of the ledger, uh, which would happen with something like CK Snarks. Uh, meaning, we, we like the public ledger, the fact that uh, people can uh, send each other and verify payments and things like that. Um, what what I think uh, we don't like is uh, for payments to be uh, traceable and for people not to have an option for spending privately. And I think that's what's uh, solved with private send uh, in Dash, where you're able to mix your coins. And um, but I don't think we we want 
Um, we certainly want to improve it, and I know Evan has plans for the third uh, layer and, and how that's going to improve the user experience in the process of mixing. Um, because I don't think you can get uh, many different levels of untraceability. You either can trace a, a transaction or you can't, right? Um, so I think you are able to achieve an untraceable transaction um, using private scene right now. Uh, but I think the user experience could be improved, and uh, Evan is looking into that for, for the next layer. But in any event, we don't want to uh, do things like CK Snarks that would improve that particular area, but let's say makes us lose other important areas um, that from the money uh, property perspective, like the, the public blockchain and the ability to, for anyone to verify the ledger I think those things are important, and I am not sure how Zcash is going to handle them. Um, but from a monetary perspective, I think that the public ledger is an important element that we want to preserve. Thank you. Next question is: uh, Is there an Open Bazaar fork planned specifically for Dash? I know it's been talked about before, but is is that in the works? Um, I can speak to that one. Um, uh, I don't think we have anyone currently um, doing code uh, for for that uh, open bazaar uh, integration but we have had uh, we had a developer at some point was a volunteer type developer uh, working on on an open bazaar uh, fork uh, for dash I think that project has currently been abandoned um, mm -hmm. But mainly because the Open Bazaar code is hard coded to support Bitcoin. So right now, Bitcoin is really, really deep in the code. And we would have to do something like creating or helping them migrate into a multi currency version of Open Bazaar, which is a large amount of work. Mm -hmm. And when we approached them, there was no guarantee that, you know, if we were to go in that direction, that our pull request would ultimately be merged, right? So we have a good relationship with, with Open Bazaar, and we think they're a great project, but for market reasons, they started focusing on Bitcoin. And I think it's going to take a big effort um, to make it multi currency and they may not be ready to make that effort uh, at the moment. So it's nothing that we can eventually make happen, uh, but we would need to be motivated enough to finance a, a big project to make Open Bazaar multi-currency. Uh, so for now, I would say that it's not a priority for us to, to make it happen just as much as it's not a priority for Open Bazaar to go multi-currency at the moment. Uh, but things change quickly in crypto, so ask me in six months. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, exactly. I, I can add that I had a, an email exchange with uh, Sam Patterson about the integration with Open Bazaar, and that I can confirm what, what Daniel already said, that it's not their, their first priority to integrate other currencies. and. It would be very difficult due to the server code built on top of Bitcoin and uh, hard coded with Bitcoin. So, I think that uh, you know when we release Evolution, it will be a game changer and it would be much easier to do such things like Open Bazaar with Evolution APIs and Evolution uh, functionalities that will be open to our users and to developers. And this could this could be a good time to start think and talk about this kind of integrations. Thank you, Robert. Our next question is, uh, will someone provide an update on the fiat gateways in general? Um, yeah, I, I guess that uh, would be me. Um, OK, so um, fiat gateways has, has two two areas that um, we need to discuss. So fiat gateways in general, it, it's a priority for for the Dash uh, network at the moment, right? And so there's uh, different projects that are directed at improving that aspect, right? And within all those projects, we have one from the treasury of Dash 
uh, that we called uh, fiat gateways. So, so naming can get a bit confusing, right? So we have one project from the treasury that's called uh, fiat gateways, and then we have our interest in general in the network on on fiat um, gateways. So I think I'll start um, by giving an update on the treasury um, budget that relates to it. And then there's other things that don't fall within the treasury that also relate to fiat gateways, the concept um, that are important to mention, right? Um, so in terms of, of the project from the treasury, uh, this is a project uh, we're working on with our partner, uh, Ira Miller and the Git Guild. And in this project, it is important to understand that it is ultimately a business development project, but it includes elements of software development in order to make those business integrations happen, which is the, the goal of the whole Fiat Gateways project, right? Um, so one of the things that have happened from this project is that we have developed a series of tools, right? Um, the latest of them is a Trade Manager, right? That are, it's going to allow for anyone um, to automate trades or use uh, a broker type um, approach or integration into the Dash markets, right? Uh, so this project in particular is developing a series of backend tools that um, any business out there, either a broker business like Shapeshift or a wallet business or an exchange business uh, needs. But normally uh, the public doesn't have transparency into this sort of tools. So we have the, you need a wallet, you need a co-signature or a co-pay type tool, you need uh, a trade manager or a trade engine, uh, you're gonna need a broker. So all these are software tools that do specific things and they are building blocks to integrating uh, different coin services, right? So right now we already have a developed uh, wallets uh, for Dash, uh, we have uh, co-signatures, um, features. Um, we're working right now on the trade manager. And ultimately, this is going to be released um, pretty soon. And uh, But these leads, or the ultimate goal of this, is to integrate into partners. So one of the partners that have come from this um, relatively recently from this relationship is, is Mycelium. And my vision for it is that um, in the future, I want people to be able to exchange Dash from um, to Bitcoin or Bitcoin to Dash from within the wallet, right? Connecting to the broker that has been developed. And um, since the Mycelium wallet already supports hardware wallets like Ledger um, and KeepKey and Trezor, I want to also uh, port national functionality to the mobile wallet, to the Mycelium wallet, so that someone could get the coins from the broker, then uh, store them in the hardware wallet and make uh, a spin up a node, let's say, with node 40 uh, from the API, all from the wallet, right? So that's this is like the ultimate goal of, of this uh, project, to produce end results like this. Now, uh, it takes time, right? And there are also business considerations for the partners that are joining. Another partner that we've had um, conversations with and we're looking forward to integrate is Coin and Bolt. Uh, on my last meeting with their CEO, our agreement was that we were going to let development continue for about two months um, and, and let these tools be ready um, before we start uh, put in a, a date and started working with, with their development team to the, for the actual implementation. So, um, so things are, are really moving um, in, this, in this direction. There's a third very important partner that's part of the Fiat Gateways project and will be connected to the same framework that we've already closed, um, but I'm not at, at liberty to share right now, um, but it's one of those um, announcements or press releases that I told earlier I was working on um, potentially for later in the month. Um, so yeah, uh, that's uh, more or less where we are. Um, the trade manager will be made public um, pretty soon too. So anyone can use it. And I'm thinking about doing some sort of contest uh, to see if people 
can follow different investment strategies and see how uh, the trade manager works for them. And this is kind of cool because um, a lot of people don't have access to trading bots and things like this. And in you know by making it available publicly for anyone, I think we're also leveling the playing field for traders um, that want to play with the Dash uh, trade manager. Uh, so I think um, that's more or less where we are uh, from the treasury perspective. And now from a more general perspective, we're right now working on um, a couple of uh, debit card integrations. Uh, Check debit card is right now in closed beta. A number of people already have them. And it's kind of cool because you can instant X uh, money into the debit card so you don't have to keep a balance. Let's say okay. you get the check at, at the restaurant and just you just instant X the exact amount and three seconds later you can pass the card, right? So um, that's a good one. And another one is the SpectraCoin um, debit card that's also in the works. Uh, we're, you know, we're collaborating with them right now in their process of, of integration. So those things will also help. Uh, another project that uh, you are aware of that's not part of Treasury but is also related to access is the Jax wallet um, that's coming out pretty soon too. We're working on that release actually. And But your interview was already published so it's, it's no secret anymore. Um, so in their case I think they include a chip chip integration and you know they already have a user base for Ethereum um, Bitcoin users, so hopefully that will reduce friction for those people to move into Dash, and that's kind of the role they're looking to play. We've had a very solid um, interaction with them. They are even on the team Slack as part of the integration process, right? And we've been working with them um, a lot, uh, you know, towards this release. So um, those are things that I think are important that are happening that are not necessarily part of the treasury but are part of a more general approach um, in that area. So Thank yeah, you, that's it. All You're right. Welcome. Well, we just have two questions left, fellas. Uh, this second to last question is uh, for anyone, uh, which is, is anybody planning to speak at the upcoming Money 2020 event, which I believe is in Las Vegas in late October? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one um, because I've been to Money 2020 many times um, from my uh, prior to Dash experience. Um, for those not familiar, Money 2020 is the big event in payments um, uh, every year uh, and it's been so successful that they've launched a Money 2020 Europe uh, version. Um, it's held in Las Vegas every year and it is, uh, it's incredible. They use an enormous volume of, uh, of space uh, on the convention floor and there are hundreds of booths with all kinds of companies there. Um, Money 2020, I think, uh, to answer the question directly, this year we don't have any plans to be present. Um, I think the right timing for hitting that event would be after Evolution is released. So at next year's event, I think personally that that would be a, 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 a great event to both host a, a booth and get a private space to have uh, conversations with potential partners. Um, I think that, that there are a lot of companies there everything from payment gateways to um, uh, processors to uh, you know point of sale providers, etc. Um, that uh, the number of potential partners that you could you could speak with there is just an enormous number of people, and uh, it, it spans a number of days. Um, there's lots of interesting speeches. The, the types of folks that go to this are very senior from their organizations. On average, they're uh, you know, CEOs, direct reports, and maybe one level down. And so uh, it, it's, an, it's a great opportunity for all of those companies, and I think 
for us to network and really build uh, on our ecosystem and build our relationships in a major way. So I, I think it's an event that we should aspire to be at, potentially speak at, and and uh, and really get a lot of value out of it. I just don't think that this year is the right year. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Well, there is just one last question, fellas, and and it's been directed uh, toward Evan specifically, which is, Evan, um, do you see yourself uh, remaining on developing Dash in the long term, or do you have plans to say? hand development off to a team a la Satoshi. And after you've answered that question, um, also let us know, is there a sort of plan B for development should you get hit by a truck? <laughs> um, so I, I don't think I, I plan on doing either of those, actually. Uh, oh, good. The, <laughs> the, the one option is to just keep coding as, as I am and um, that's not really an option as we scale. And the the other one is to just hand it off and you know hope that the the people like like Satoshi did. Um, he he handed the, the the work off and the community just kind of took over and he had no uh, oversight of what was happening. A as you can see, like you know, no one knows what was Satoshi's actual vision for the project and mm -hmm. did did it get executed the way he wanted, right? And so this was kind of like my my baby. This was my project, right? And I, I have a vision, and I I don't care if the community wants to go a different way, but I want to present what I would like to do. And if they want to go that way, great. If they if they want to go another way, let's vote to do the the other way. But I'd like to at least present it, right? So I, I would say that the middle road is what I want. I, I want a team of people that are competent, that I train, uh, and that that come aboard and and kind of take the reins as as it were and take over core development of, of the Dash D site. And so uh, we already have a team working on Dash D. I'm training a, a couple people right now to, to take over my work. And, and so this, this is actually already underway. Uh, we're, we've got two new C++ developers that have just started over the last few days, and uh, they're doing great work. And so if I do get hit by a bus, there are other people now that know how all of this works and, and know what was in store. So everything would still be okay, although I wouldn't be, be sad. <laughs> <laughs> you would be sad and dead. <laughs> yep. So, and now, Evan, I know you had mentioned a few days ago that uh, you were potentially looking for a Node.js developer. Is that still the case? Uh, yeah, so if anybody has any experience with Node.js uh, and other technologies um, are would be a plus, would be a Python, uh, C++ and in just these other technologies that we're utilizing in the project. Although we want somebody that's really, really strong with Node.js, and this is for the uh, evolution front end side of the thing. So this person would be working closely with uh, Andy Freer, who who heads that team. Um, so yeah, if if you have uh, if you have the experience, go ahead and check out. I, there's a theoretical job post on our job board about this that I'm not sure exists. <laughs> it's real at dash.org slash forum. It's the third post down. Oh, perfect. Okay, so yeah, go check that out and follow the instructions there. <laughs> Very good. All right, well, fellas, that does it for today. Uh, before we sign off, I would just like to give each of you, if you'd like to take a maximum of 30 seconds, uh, to say anything that you feel like you want to say. I'd like to give you the opportunity to do that. Uh, I'll take it. Um, I will just like to say that uh, business development is an iterative process that uh, we can expect progress. But I think also that's important that for us as a DAO to understand that we are interacting with uh, projects and companies that are not DAOs. So as a DAO interacting with projects that are not DAOs, we're going to have to learn to uh, work with them and respect the fact that sometimes they, they can't release certain information until they're really ready. And although we would love to share everything we have as soon as we have it, uh, we can't. Um, but we're working hard uh, towards expanding our ecosystem. And as you finally see public announcements coming out, I think you'll be very, very pleased. Thank you, Daniel. Would anyone else care to say anything? 
Yeah, I'd like to uh, say something. I, I, I have been, you know, involved with this project since very, very early on uh, um, and have been watching the change occur in the amount of professionalism, resources, um, uh, uh, processes, the partnerships that we're building, and so forth. And something has happened over the course of the last, I would say, three to six months and continues to happen, which is this project is switching gears. I, I think it switched gears when we introduced the budget system. I think it switched gears again towards the beginning of this year when a lot of the efforts behind um, that, that, the, that that type of functionality uh, and visibility on the project started to expand and, and I think we hit we are hitting another gear right now is allowing us to expand this project uh, almost exponentially. It's, it's insane the, the growth that you can see on the ground in terms of the people coming forward to work with us, in terms of the people that we can uh, afford to support at this point. And I really feel like things are about to uh, shift into an even higher gear. It's going to be exciting the second half of this year. Really excited. Thank you, Ryan. And anyone else? Uh, All right. I'll take a, Please. I'll, I'll take 30 seconds. Um, I, I wanted to say that things have been changing, and it's really exciting. Uh, for, for example, I, I just got these two new C++ people, which has reduced my workload probably about four or five hours a day. And so now I'm, I'm all over the project in ways that I haven't been in a while, able to like uh, tinker and help everybody. And, and this has kind of just been um, you know, happening every few months over and over again. These, we're, we're gaining efficiency which is nice, as, as we're figuring out how to do this. And actually, we're starting to see the results of it, which is the really exciting part, because this is the fun part, where we actually get to launch this product and, and prove all of this technology works. And it's all brand new technology. So it's, it's an exciting thing that there's you know, other ways to run companies that are purely decentralized. And we figured it out. So you know, this, this will be history in the making. Thank you, Evan. And I feel like you should say something too, Robert. <laughs> okay, I will. So maybe I'll take an, an opportunity to thank you, Amanda, for this great interview and a chance to talk to our community. And I would like to thank our community as well for, for the trust and all the support they are giving to, to us, to the entire core team. And just to say that it's an exciting journey and experience to be a part of this project. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Robert. Well, and Holger, uh, though you were not with us verbally, I like to believe that you are with us in spirit, and I'd like to say thank you for that. I am sure that it helped. And a congratulations to all of you uh, on the all-time high market cap reached about 48 hours ago of 70 million plus US dollars. Big congratulations there. It's, a, it's just a, a stepping stone, I know, to future things. And thank you all for your time. And now, Dash Detailed viewer, I would like to know your feedback. Did you enjoy today's group interview episode of the Dash team? And would you like to see more of these in the future? Just let me know in the comment section below, and I'll see you next Wednesday been a Bitcoin person, been an Ethereum person, but really I'm an agnostic. I, I like choice and I think that's great for everybody. So we want to be that agnostic blockchain wallet that allows people to make the choices which which currencies and which tokens they want to be dealing with. That's that's our goal. So when we reached out, it was just a very, a very uh, loud response of, hey, we'd love to see Dash inside of Jax. And that's what we started to put our efforts towards. <laughs>